So welcome to the 21st uh, meetup, so Sofia Crypto Meetup. Um, our meetup obviously has grown. It's now 21 months old. Uh, actually, on, on December, we don't do a, a meetup usually, so uh, we skipped a month. But nonetheless, this is the 21st month in which have, we have organized this meetup. Um, and since the last couple of months, we have been doing uh, this uh, thing where we announce uh, or talk about the most important or the most interesting news from the sphere uh, for the past month. And which are the most important things? Usually th those are uh, the ones that people vote about. And we organize a, a poll. Oh, okay. A poll which uh, where everyone can vote on their best options. And you can see this is the result from the poll. I have taken this information down today. You can see the Ethereum's Byzantium fork is the most important, most interesting thing this month, followed by the Tesla's tobacco, Bitcoin gold fork, and then price of Bitcoin and IBM Stellar partnership. And I'll be talking briefly before we begin with the, the primary topic of our present, of our event actually. Uh, we will begin uh, by mentioning or talking about these things briefly. So the first one, see a lot of text here. Uh, the, the Byzantium fork of Ethereum happened. It happened um, as part of the Metropolis, Metropolis upgrade. Maybe, maybe a, lot, a lot of people uh, know that. It activated on this block at 8.22 BG time on October 16th. Um, and it's actually the fifth hard fork of uh, Ethereum. E and includes a lot of um, improvements. And I have actually bolded the more important ones uh, from these uh, smaller changes. Better difficulty adjust adjustment is something uh, very important for the miners. Uh, because if you know Ethereum, there is this uh, difficulty bump that is being spread throughout the network, which increases the difficulty for, for mining. So it prepares the network for the move to proof of stake, which is unclear when it's going to happen, actually. Um, the there is a decrease of uh, mining rewards as well. So each block now produces less eaters. Um, but everywhere where I looked, it, it was mentioned that it's now uh, it's a faster and cheaper blockchain, but I'm not sure what exactly that means. Uh, maybe someone can, can elaborate on that later. And then there is this thing of embedding transactions, return data in receipts, which is very important for, for light nodes. And this is also related to the move uh, to the proof of stake system. But there are two very big updates, actually, big changes. Uh, and they're related to smart contracts and uh, ZK SNARKs. Um, crypt cryptography uh, and smart contracts now they're better better handling the faulty code which has been a very big issue uh, with a lot of smart contracts uh, they are secure against re-entrancy attacks so you're using a code which you insert inside of the smart, smart contract and you take over that smart, smart contract uh, with this new upgrade uh, these types of attacks shouldn't happen and lifecycle update, now when you are creating a smart contract, it's possible to uh, insert, insert some information inside which later can be used to update the state or update the smart contract itself. Which, I mean, since smart contracts are one of the most important things of the Ethereum network, is quite good. Um, ZK SNARKs, if you know this, it's related to uh, Zcash, this uh, cryptocurrency, anonymous cryptocurrencies. Um, more or less, Ethereum um, have implemented ZK SNARKs for their, uh, in their system on, on their blockchain. This is actually what Z uh, ZK, ZK SNARKs means. I'm not going to read that. Um, so it's the whole idea is that you can prove that you know something. Um, I mean, uh, a system can prove that it has some information without revealing what that information is. And it should improve an anonymity quite a lot for Ethereum. And now it's possible to directly uh, order and trade, uh, to, to, to execute orders and trades between Zcash and Ethereum. And I guess this perhaps could be a reason for the increase of the Zcash price, which we uh, witnessed um, a couple of weeks ago. And 
Unfortunately, there is no release date for the Constantinople, which is the, uh, the other part of the Metropolis upgrade, and which is the most, uh, most interesting from mat mathematical or research point of view. And uh, one of the reasons that I saw uh, was that these upgrades that are being implemented, they just uh, do this endless loop of problems. They create this en endless uh, loop of problems, and now it's currently, I mean, unclear when this second st step will be implemented. Okay, so that's all for the Byz Byzantium or Byzantium, uh, yeah, upgrade, and we move to the Tezos. So this is uh, uh, the debacle, and uh, if you don't know Tezos, it's a, it's a company that is planning to create a blockchain which is, um, I mean, improves itself, so to say. And it has, the, the code or the idea comes from these two people, Arthur and Kathleen Brightman, who are the founders, and they have, together with John and Greaves, they have created this Swiss, Swiss foundation uh, in order to organize the ICO. Um, and they managed to raise 20, 232 million uh, dollars three months ago, and now this sum is about 40, what is it, 40, 40, 40, Hundred, four hundred million dollars, uh, which is quite substantial sum for any project. Uh, but yeah, um, especially a startup one with basically more or less no working product. Um, currently, the foundation, the Swiss foundation, which is managed by uh, Johan Giver, so yeah, whatever his name is, uh, they have the funds. They have all the funds that uh, have been uh, raised. And the plan was that um, the foundation should at some point acquire this company by the uh, Brightmans. Um, but unfortunately, this uh, is not yet clear when it's going to happen. And the Brightmans decided to seek or try to remove Givers from, from the foundation, from the head of the foundation, since they believe he's doing stuff that, uh, that he shouldn't be doing, like self-dealing, self-promotion, and has some conflicts of interest. Um, they have sent a 46-page letter, actually their lawyers sent a 46-page letter to, um, to, to, to Givers, and um, in order to, to make him step down. Also, two members of the foundation also um, have asked him via email to, to stand down, but so far he decided, I mean, he hasn't done that, and he has said that he's not going to do that. Um, and unfortunately, everyone who has invested or has sent Ethereum or any kind of cryptocurrency, I think only Ethers, or Ethers and Bitcoins actually, um, has not received anything or not these, has not received thesis. This, this is the name of the token, thesis. And it's not yet um, very clear when this is going to happen or if it's going to happen. Although Jeevers uh, has uh, mentioned that he wants to make this this project a success. And uh, since they have been presented as non-refundable donations, these uh, sense of uh, cryptocurrencies, um, from a legal point of view, um, or according to Reuters, it's possible that no one will receive anything. Although I'm not sure, I mean, it's going to be hard to, 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 to follow this course, but we'll see what's going to happen. Um, what the deal actually is, or was, it was that the Brightmans will get 8.5% of the, all the uh, fundraised money, which is about $20 million, and then 10% of the, of, the, of the tokens, which is now worth about $140 million. And they um, were supposed to get the $140 million in four years. Um, currently, the Ethers and Bitcoins are being sold by the foundation for fiat currency, I believe. Uh, and it's about, they're selling about 10.2 million uh, worth of cryptocurrency per week. So this is, I mean, in a, in a way this is creating some, some amount of uh, supply of eaters uh, in the market. But yeah, this is the situation. You can see the guys, the Ar Arthur and uh, Caitlin there. Uh, Reuters have, uh, actually they have, um, uh, done a very in-depth analysis of the situation, and this information is taken from there. Um, so we'll see what's going to happen. Hopefully this will, this will not uh, lead to some kind of a crackdown on ICOs uh, on a global scale. And hopefully that people who have sent cryptocurrency to this project will get something in return. 
Uh, and you can see the price of, uh, of Daisy's, uh, what has happened with it. It has uh, gone down quite a bit, but I mean, not that much, I would say. It's half, it's just half, <laughs> just half. This is the futures price because the thesis, the thesis are not actually uh, out yet. I mean, there is no token already. There is, there are no distributed tokens to anyone. So this is futures, only futures. Um, and then we go to the Bitcoin, Bit Bitcoin fork split, which is the other, uh, actually the most recent one. Um, who, who organized this? Who is behind this Bitcoin gold uh, fork? Actually, I have uh, mentioned fork split because forks do not necessarily lead to a split of the system. I mean, Ethereum did the Byzantium fork, but this did not split the system. But this is an intentional split fork. And who is behind this? It's this guy, Jack Liao, La Liao something like this, who is selling, selling GPUs. And he uh, had this idea that um, ISIC miners or his colleagues from China who are pr producing the, that, that, that equipment shouldn't be getting all the action, I guess, and decided to uh, do a fork of Bitcoin in order to make Bitcoin mineable with GPUs or his version of Bitcoin, of course. Um, and there is this uh, pseudo-anonymous guy who, who actually joined the development team and five other uh, people were also in. And I, I also believe that there is a one Bulgarian inside this. Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I haven't I haven't really met him. I heard about the name, but I forgot it. Um, so the main the main goal is to replace i6 with GPUs, and he's using the Equihash algorithm, mining algorithm, which uh, is also used by Zcash. And actually, uh, the mining algorithm of Eternity is cuckoo, called Cuckoo Cycle, and it's very similar to to Equihash. So this is very interesting. Um, Another change, big change in Bitcoin Gold, uh, Bitcoin Gold, yes, um, is this difficulty ad adjustment. Each block uh, changes the difficulty, which is quite different in the cases of the other um, Bitcoins. I'll show you a table uh, in, a, in, a, in a, just next slide is the table. And this uh, slogan, make Bitcoin decentralized again, uh, kind of sounds familiar, I would say. Um, it, it, it happened. You know, on, on that block on the 24th, so yeah, yesterday actually. And uh, the other interesting thing is that um, although the, for the, split, the fork split happened, um, no one has received Bitcoin gold uh, coins yet because the, the team is currently pre-mining those. They are mining for themselves and they are going to keep 1% of all these tokens or cryptocurrency for themselves. Um, yeah, they, for, the, for the whole dev team. And one, once this is over, they should, be, uh, they should distribute uh, or allow the distribution of the other, uh, of, of Bitcoin Gold to all the other users. Uh, and currently there are about 20 exchanges and wallets who have decided to support this uh, altcoin. Let's call it an altcoin. But Coinbase said no to them. And you can see, yeah, maybe. Um, and you can see a comparison here between the, the other. So there are so many bitcoins, bitcoins or whatever, bitcoins now. Or the, the last one, I mean, it's not clear if you have it, but most probably. Um, so you can see it's Equihash and then F difficulty adjustment on every, every block. The good thing is that they also have uh, SegWit and they have thought about replay protection and unique addresses. So it's, it's something, I guess. I think the price is about $300 now of, of futures, the futures again, the futures price of this coin, about 300. And all the other news or these smaller things that have happened, um, the price of Bitcoin, many people believe that this, uh, this, has, uh, this has gone up due to the splits, the Bitcoin gold split and the 2x split, fork split. Um, because when the network splits, if you have one Bitcoin, you get one Bitcoin from the other one, I mean, from the new one, from, on the new network. And um, I mean, I'm not sure what exactly the, the reason is, but this sounds like something very uh, logical. And then we have IBM and Stellar, which, I mean, it's not such a 
great news, I would say, but since it was mentioned, I have to also mention it. Um, they have created this blockchain, IBM have created this uh, blockchain, they use cryptocurrency which is called Stellar, and it should improve the speed between, uh, for, for clearing a settlement for financial institutions. And actually, um, a bit later, a few days later, uh, MasterCard uh, said that they have also created a new blockchain. It's a private blockchain, and they don't use, but they don't use any cryptocurrency in it. So it's, uh, I mean, it's functioning in a totally different way. Again, they're thinking about banks and businesses. And uh, this is what we have. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Why is it moving that slowly? Somebody in the way. Ah, oh, I see a camera there. Can you remove the camera? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. For some reason, the, the, the speed of light doesn't function that well here. Okay, so Bitcoin. You see here, uh, this, these are all the meetups that we had, that we have had. And you see the price uh, uh, on the day of, the, of each meetup. So um, you can see how it's, it's kind of rising. Um, but yeah, yes. But you can see that we have been struggling here for a long time before we, we got to above above 1,000. Uh, and with Ether, it's more or less the same situation. Uh, you see that has gone up, but the 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 final picture isn't that great. Uh, I mean, it's not bad, but still it's going down a little bit. And what we have now is our first presentation by Maya Medjedelieva. Sorry, it's a complex name. And then we have the panel discussion related to regulation and, yeah, legal aspects of tokens. Big applause for Maya. So hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Okay, let's have the first slide, maybe. Yes. Okay, so let's have a look at the regulation of the ICOs. As you know, all know, maybe, uh, the initial coin offering is a way for blockchain-based startups to raise financing, thus avoiding the standard methods of risk financing through funds and banks. These options are beneficial for fund-seeking startups in terms of stability of the funding institution and well-established financing mechanisms. However, the standard methods involve a number of circumstances that do not appeal to startups, such as interest payment, collateral share provision, disclosures, and compliance with mentor instructions. Ethereum blockchain enables developers to build applications using the so-called smart contracts, which is a new form of digitized legal relationships. This innovation, existing on top of the foundation layer, introduced the concept of tokens into the blockchain space. With the initial coin offering, the issuing company offers the public certain digital assets, which are usually called coins or tokens, paid for by established cryptocurrency, usually blockchain or Ether. Uh, funds raised this way are mostly used for support of the relevant blockchain and investors rely on benefiting from the project's resource, uh, while the tokens of some project also grant a right to dividends or bonuses. Unlike the initial public offering, uh, the initial coin offering is unregulated, at least for now, which is the reason for its appeal to investors. So, what is a token? Pursuant to one of the definitions I know, tokens do not even exist mostly because they always have very specific meaning. Um, if we should uh, uh, compare tokens to cryptocurrency, you should know that currency represent banknotes and coins in circulation as means of exchange, while an asset under the international financing standards is a resource from which a future economy, economic benefit is expected. From this point of view, coins give a single function, to embody value for exchange purposes, without having their own value. While tokens, usually, for example, those which are generated in the Ethereum blockchain, have many other functions or rather cover many more opportunities. The distinction between a token and cryptocurrency is fundamental with regard to the treatments of such assets and mainly from tax point of view, which is very important. We should discuss this a little bit later. 
uh, if we should compare uh, tokens to shares, uh, in the classical case, tokens do not implement the fundamental right which is vested in a share. Uh, this is the ownership of a part of the project assets, entitling to a liquidation share upon termination of the project, the so-called liquidation quota. Holders of tokens, however, often have the right to vo vote on key project issues. They also sometimes have the right to a dividend or bonus on profits. Moreover, depending on the particular project, in the event of a new token issue, current token holders may be allowed to purchase new tokens under preferential conditions, depending on the size of their holdings in the project, which partly corresponds to shareholders' right to participate in the capital increase. Without going into very further details, it should be noted that in a situation where tokens materialize ownership, their legal nature will be close to the definition of securities. There, um, so that they will be subject to legal regulation, but this is not currently desired by the issuers. While tokens are virtual project assets, they move along the edge of an unregulated matter. However, if they materialize ownership, it is a matter of uh, time the tokens to be considered as securities and therefore regulated. A potential way to treat tokens is define them as a kind of license to use a particular application or to participate in a network. However, given that a fixed fee is legally paid for a license or at least a fee with certain limits, we can hardly talk us as incorporating any licensing rights. So, if we must put a definition on the table, a token is a digital or crypto asset or the balance of some kind of account. So, what types of tokens are there? The main distinguishing lines upon classifying tokens are whether the tokens are backed up by any fiat money or some asset in the off-chain world. So, the tokens may be potentially divided into three, three groups. Into three groups, sorry. The so-called protocol tokens, representing only rights or assets on the blockchain. These might be tokens that allow the use of a certain blockchain, hence the key to complete a transaction on that specific blockchain. Prominent example is Bitcoin or also the Ether. Such tokens often come into existence through mining. Usually they have the main feature of a cryptocurrency. They are used as a payment means between participants. So, the second is the traditional asset tokens or right-related tokens. These are tokens representing assets from the off-chain world. Tokens could represent any form and type of hardware from gold to fiat currency or real estate properties, intellectual property, etc. An example is the Tether. What is inherent for traditional asset tokens is a rule that the product they are based on could exist without the tokens. For example, the Bitcoin blockchain could not exist without the Bitcoin token, but Ripple could easily do so. And the right-related tokens, these tokens represent rights that are not related to any material assets. The most prominent example are equity tokens that are supposed to represent shares or interest in companies and entities. A right-related token only represents the ownership in a certain right that itself is related to an asset owned by the social environment. Uh, Maybe, oh, and is the more important now? Okay, the regulation, the regulation of the ICOs. Does it exist? As already underlined, the fundamental question that every ICO organizer should ask is whether the PLA token is a security and therefore subject to regulation. Under the European law, the answer is not straightforward because the financial directive, which is the most relevant law for investment services providers, for a definition of transferable securities such as shares and bonds and also any other, for, other forms of securities, which are basically defined as classes of securities negotiable on the capital market. Theoretically, none of the securities type mentioned in the definition applies to most tokens. However, the securities mentioned in the definition are just examples and the list is not exhaustive. If the definition is applied on various types of tokens, intrinsic tokens will not be subject to securities law as it is understood in the European Union, as far as they do not represent equity rights in a company and they do not result in a claim for payment or future trading of assets, they should be exempt from European securities law in its current form.
As to the asset backed and rights related tokens, whether securities law apply on them will depend on the assets backing or the rights related to the token. If those tokens represent assets, a certification of which, of which would be subject to securities law if traded on the financial market, then also these tokens will be regarded as securities. And the same holds for the right related tokens. If those rights are related to payment claims or equity positions in entities that would be subject to securities law, the same will apply on such tokens. And something which will be very uh, interesting for you, the hallway test. In USA, there is an official guidance called the Howey test, whether a transaction is an investment contract and therefore subject to regulation. This is very important here. <coughs> Uh, it is a little bit very specific, however, really important. Please note that the fact that uh, your ICO is not based in the USA uh, does not mean that the Howey test does not, does not affect your ICO. Uh, as to the extent you have any relation with any US entity, for example, you have a, a bank account in the USA, you receive money for, from a US bank account, uh, you send money to a US bank account or whatever, you have clients which are US citizens, you're involved and you're subject to US regulations. Uh, and uh, uh, you may be uh, charged by their financial institutions. Also, if your tokens are listed to an exchange which is based in the US, uh, in the USA, such as the Poloniex, you are involved and you should consider the Howey test, so it is very important. Uh, if you have not passed the Howey test, the issuer is subject to certain registration requirements plus disclosures such as uh, certain financial st statements, prospectus, and so on. So your tokens will be subject to regulation if the transaction. First, it is an investment of money. Although the Howey test uses the term money, later cases have expanded this to include investments of assets other than money. Um, on the sec uh, second, uh, there is an expectation of profits from the investment. There is a lot of practical advice that should be considered here. Uh, for example, when you organize your ICO, you should never um, mention the word uh, profits, never. On the Slack channel, on Telegram, um, on some communication with uh, your investors, never. Because profit is something which is related um, uh, to a security. And uh, if you are talking as a security, you will be regulated. So do not mention the word profit. It's never. Uh, on the third place, the investment of money is in a common enterprise. Hello, I know it is a little bit specific, however, I'll try to explain. The term common enterprise isn't precisely defined and courts have used different interpretation. Most federal courts, it's in the USA again, define a common enterprise as one that is horizontal, meaning that investors pool their money or assets together to invest in a project. And the fourth criterion, any profit comes from the efforts of a promoter or third party. The final factor of the Howey test concerns whether any profit that comes from the investment is largely or wholly outside of the investor's control, like the IPO. If so, when the investment might be a security. If, however, the investors, the investors' own action largely dictate whether an investment will be profitable, then that investment is probably not a security. In deciding how it, how it case, the Supreme Court created a test that looks at an investment substance rather than its form as the determining factor for whether it is a security. Even if an investment is not labeled as a stock or a bond, it may very well be a security under the law, meaning that registration requirements will apply. There is also another test, which is called the Reef test. However, we shall not discuss it here because it will be really uh, very... Uh, uh, maybe subject to other discussion. Let's consider uh, one very interesting topic, the ICOs and the US citizens. It is very interesting. Anyone who has uh, um, recently participated in a cryptocurrency ICO or pre-ICO may have noticed how uh, these offerings are in theory not available to residents in the USA. The United States is quite strict when it comes to investment regulations. Only accredited investors can partake in... <coughs> Excuse me 
in private placements of securities. So while some people would urge all cryptocurrency ICOs are tokens and not securities, regulators will have a very different opinion regarding this matter. So the team uh, organizing cryptocurrency ICO cannot guarantee only accredited US investors will partake. However, they can take the necessary steps to prevent most US citizens from investing, although these measures can be bypassed. And right now, the ICOs tend to ask if you are US citizens to tick, I am not an American citizen. But there is no verification of whether or not one speaks the truth. Some projects use geolocation to, blo to block US citizens, but those can be bypassed with a proxy or by VPN. It is impossible to prevent US citizens from participating. However, it is important that uh, you will be able to guarantee that you have undertaken some measures to prevent these from participation in your ICO. This is very important. Uh, one, the Security Exchange Commissions, which is the um, US body governing the ICOs, uh, uh, will effectively intervene in cryptocurrency ICOs, which will happen. It is just a matter of time. Things will get very interesting, to say at least. Um, a lot of previous ICOs didn't take the necessary steps to deny US citizens from participating. All of those projects and their teams are at the mercy of the Security Exchange Commission. Uh, violating US securities law is not something anyone wants to deal with. Additionally, these laws uh, can also be enforced upon non-US companies, which makes it even more important to take countermeasures. So, how to organize my ICO? <clears throat> um, well, it should be considered that every case is different. However, the uh, scheme which is uh, the most popular is using two entities. One is the ICO company, which issues the tokens, you see, and which gathers the money from the investors. It, these are the contribution, usually made in Ethers and Bitcoin. And the other is the operating company. Usually, there is a um, service uh, uh, or, or consulting uh, contract between the two companies. This is uh, the most popular scheme. You understand uh, that uh, the scheme can, can be more and more and more complex. Uh, there may, may be up to 10 or even 15 entities involved here, um, which are um, in um, various jurisdictions, such as Singapore, various uh, countries in Europe, Switzerland, and so on and so on. So this scheme um, do not copy directly. <laughs> uh, it is just uh, the most popular scheme, which uh, may be used. Well, I know that is very interesting for you. How much does it cost? You should consider <laughs> the price uh, because uh, you will have some expenses, yes. Therefore, uh, legal fees for uh, financial um, uh, consulting and for marketing, 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 and marketing. Uh, it's also a legal um, topic. I will be very brief on this, however, I should touch upon this. Uh, whether the Payment uh, Services Directive applies on ICOs, it is important from legal point of view. Uh, it might seem that the US Payment Services and Electronic Money Regulations should apply to cryptocurrencies. However, this is not the case. The PSD Directive, which is the most important uh, European directive on uh, um, uh, payment services regulations, does not apply to cryptocurrencies. And something which is also uh, most important and which will be, I hope, very interesting for you, it is the VAT regulations. Uh, mining and trading of cryptocurrencies and crypto tokens poses numerous issues regarding tax law. I'm sure you know the applicable act is the Sixth Directive or the VIT Directive. In 2015, I think, yes, the ECJ, which is the European Court of Justice, ruled that exchanges of Bitcoin for traditional currencies and vice versa constitute a supply of a service effected for consideration. And these exchanges, these exchange transactions are tax exempt according to the VAT directive, irrespective of whether they are legal tender in one or more countries. The ECJ based its decision on several considerations, notably on the fact that, as with all financial transactions, it is difficult to determine the taxable amount and the amount, and therefore the, the amount of the tax, uh, the, the, the deductible VAT. And the participating parties consider and accepted Bitcoin as an alternative to legal tender with the purpose to be a means of payment. 
something about the VAT exemptions. Within the last few years, more and more different kinds of cryptocurrencies and crypto tokens have emerged, and even more are going to be created, possibly at even higher frequency. This development includes tokens which do not only stem from mining, um, uh, and computational power in a network or protocol, but also represent all sorts of things in the non-digital world. Storage network, even equity in the form shares of or interest. They usually can be exchanged for these services and goods, but can also be traded on the secondary markets. Uh, again, the ECJ ruling presented above deals with Bitcoin specifically. It is rather controversial among experts whether the court's findings can be extended and applied to all cryptocurrencies and tokens. <coughs> I'll try to be uh, very brief here. Now, however, the reasoning on which the ECJ based, based its decision shall, in our opinion, apply not only on to Bitcoin, but to all kinds of cryptocurrencies and crypto tokens which are regularly traded uh, for the purpose to be a means of payment. In our view, this involves at least all currencies which can be found on exchanges such as Poloniex and maybe Kraken. Both ECJ's above-mentioned core arguments also hold true for tokens, which, unlike Bitcoin, are linked to specific services and goods, but are regularly exchanged for traditional currencies. Once crypto tokens are traded in exchange for traditional currency, one is engaged in a financial transaction. No matter if the token one has received in exchange has additional features comparing to Bitcoin. Thus, the difficulties to determine the VAT base remain the same as Bitcoin. Furthermore, only because the token might be linked to equity or digital storage, this does not mean it has a purpose other than being a means of payment. In contrast, especially in cases in which a token's issuer accepts this token in exchange for a particular service, the token's purpose will be to enable this sort of payment, whereas in the case of Bitcoin, one could argue that there is no a priori payment opportunity involved. Currently, we are quite confident that the ECJ meant its ruling to be applicable to all cryptocurrencies and tokens, or at least would rule similarly in future decisions. So, in summary, uh, we could tell that the initial coin offering is a way for blockchain-based startups to raise financing. The tokens are not cryptocurrencies, or mostly most of them. <laughs> they are not regulated as a security, but this is so far. They are VAT exempt so far. And uh, the, um, the PSD, the, fi the financial, the uh, payment services directive, um, does not apply to them so far. Thank you, Maya, for this uh, overview. Um, and we can now begin the panel. And I'm sure you have a lot of discussion, of a lot of questions, or maybe a few at least. Uh, we have Georgi, who will join us here, and Maya, and Ivo. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, you are. <laughs> uh, by the way, we, we pronounced the third speaker. Unfortunately, uh, he excused himself because he's sick which is the typical time of the year, everybody gets sick. But um, we have participation of Sofia Legal Hackers. If at some point they want to answer questions, they can be here, Viara probably can point to people. Oh, we have more legal people in the room, so the, the, any question you guys have, you can, can just shoot. And why I'll be here? Okay. <laughs> so I'll be here taking your questions and uh, giving the mic to the guys. Let's see how many ICOs. Who is planning to do an ICO? Should I? Should I? Okay. Some. Who is interested in the legal challenges based on you guys? Now you want to sell it at 300x and you're thinking of how to pay your VAT. Who is having this? Okay, more hands here, that's good. What is the first question? Uh, what are the legal aspects of starting an ICO in Bulgaria and whether do you recommend starting an ICO in Bulgaria or in another country? 
in Europe or not? Who wants to take this one? Or start taking it? Ladies <laughs> first. Okay. Uh, well, uh, as, I, uh, as I told, the ICO is not regulated in Bulgaria. However, to the extent your ICO uh, has some connection with the USA, for example, you have a bank account in the USA, um, or you receive money from a bank account in the USA. Some of your clients have um, um, uh, sent you money from a bank account in the USA. USA, you will be affected by the USA regulations, and they are very strict. Uh, there are uh, charges, penalties, um, and uh, which is the most which is the most important it may be considered as a criminal offense uh, so you should consider the how we test I know that it's a little bit specific for you however this is not so complex as it looked here and you should consider all of these cr uh, criteria I uh, spoke about um, a little this is not so complex it, it may uh, look uh, on the first side um, uh, as to your second question which is uh, the most um, uh, preferential uh, jurisdiction to base your ICO um, well usually <laughs> <laughs> it is a paid consultation. <laughs> however, in brief, uh, it's a joke, of course. Uh, however, in brief, um, you should consider maybe the Far East and Europe. Uh, to be honest, uh, in the Far East, you shall need more consultants. Um, it will be uh, hard to uh, organize it from here and to scale it from here. So maybe I will may recommend Europe. Uh, in Europe, usually, the ICOs are based in Switzerland. Why? Because uh, many of the clients clients uh, who, uh, who come to me, uh, uh, their first question is, uh, please uh, tell me um, uh, the country in which uh, uh, there are no regulations to base my ICO, which in my opinion is not correct, because all uh, the, the ICOs and the, all the crypto um, issues uh, will be regulated uh, one day. So um, uh, my recommendation would be the, to go to a country uh, where, uh, where there are regulations, and you may know them, and to comply with these regulations. So I could recommend uh, Switzerland and so uh, and also for uh, tax reasons uh, Cyprus and maybe Malta. This is in brief. Um, also in the last years, yes, but I'm not sure about uh, um, uh, the regulations about opening of bank account there. So it should be further investigated. Hello. Uh, okay, so my name is Georgi, I'm a lawyer uh, at Russian Fan Partners law firm in Bulgaria. Uh, I'm interested in I'm focusing in crypto uh, and even the last for the last five to seven years uh, we have uh, done a lot of things with the crypto guys here in Bulgaria. So this is for me, and regarding your questions, uh, maybe I can summarize that uh, starting uh, and launching can token generation event here in Bulgaria is a matter of considerations, and, but it's really important to structure your uh, uh, token generation event very carefully and to consider all the facts uh, which are connected to the token economy, uh, to structure uh, the tokens being not a security at all, and to consider all the things that Maya have mentioned uh, in his presentations, especially the how it test uh, and so the other stuff. Uh, to repeat it once again, the how it test is really important and it should be considered. Uh, it, it's uh, something that is really uh, costly, but uh, if you intend to structure your ICO properly, you better do that. Um, regarding the other possible countries to launch the, your token generation event, you can do it uh, in Europe, yes, that's a good destination, 
as he asked Estonia is such a country it's not obligated that you launch the event at the at one country and that your bank accounts are in the same country uh, it, it can vary from country to country from occasion to occasion and so on so that's for me I have something uh, to add. Actually, there is uh, a resource, some kind of an organization created this um, um, useful table that you can use to go through, like you answer questions in this table and then you can, to a certain degree, determine uh, if your coins could be considered a security or utility tokens. And this is free, the table is in a, in a Google Sheet, so anyone can copy it and then do uh, a fill it in for their ICO. And it's very, very helpful. Um, it has been shared in the group. I will share it again um, as part of, uh, like when I'm sharing information related to this event. Okay, so. Small it's, yeah, the, the so-called small how it test. And one guy, okay, in the back. Yeah, thank you. So uh, we heard, we heard uh, like, from your point of view, maybe the how we test is like the biggest uh, issue in, uh, that is uh, uh, a legal obstacle that ICOs have to hurdle over. But what my uh, interest in this conference was mainly because of the fifth anti money laundering directive, which actually uh, is going to, to uh, op make ICOs and even Bitcoin or whatever crypto exchanges uh, an obliged entity in the sense of anti-money laundering laws. So you have to make uh, due diligence exercises to identify and verify your clients. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? And do you think that this could be like the real uh, obstacle that ICOs would have to pass? Uh, Anti-money laundering. Uh, uh, well, of course, the uh, uh, the Howey test and the Reeves test are, are uh, not uh, first. There are not some legal obstacles. Uh, uh, you should only comply with uh, with their rules. There are not some obstacles. Uh, if you if you do not pass the Howey test, uh, your tokens will be regarded as security, and then you will be subject to reg subject to regulation, which is not something evil. <laughs> um, uh, uh, as to your uh, question, the anti-money laundering and the know your customer rules are are uh, very important and they should be considered and um, uh, very well defined in your white paper. Uh, so, um, um, uh, of course, the, uh, these two topics, the, the, the AML and the Know Your Customer Rules, uh, they should be considered on the very first place. So, um, uh, but uh, this is the job of your consultants. <laughs> and of course, it should be covered in the, in the white paper itself. Compliance, Compliance officer, maybe, maybe not the uh, department. <laughs> As trusts, as wallets, the wallets are like, you know. Um, so if you have a, if you are considered like a, a trust entity or whatever, you ha you would have to report on, under FATCA, under common reporting standards, 
all these issues, I think, should be discussed. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping that in, maybe in future meetings we, we would have like a, uh, an option to talk about that. Yeah. So, yeah, my question is, do you, do you think that cryptocurrencies could be considered as a financial asset? Are cryptocurrencies considered a financial asset? <laughs> What's your nationality? It's ten percent, and dividend is five percent. But when you distribute uh, dividend is five percent tax. When you di when you distribute dividends and when it's in a corporate, in, in an entity, then you pay 5%, not 10. Capital gain tax is 10. Uh, so uh, regarding your question, uh, which was, uh, is the cryptocurrency a financial asset? Uh, so this, is, this answer should be said by the regulators and not by us and your consultants, your legal consultants should properly advise you um, what to do uh, with your cryptocurrency so that you don't get into any regulative problems or issues, uh, etc. Uh, and uh, about the KYC and the anti-money laundering procedures, if you're planning um, token sale or token generation event, then you uh, better start and consider uh, having such an procedures, but uh, have in mind that this might um, harness your business uh, structure, uh, your business uh, structure of the token generation event. So if you are uh, very legally oriented, this might uh, affect your token generation event. But you better do that. Hi. Um, I'd like to ask a question about uh, decentralized autonomous of, uh, organizations and how are they affected by ICOs? About DAOs and this kind of. Uh, so your question is uh, about uh, some legal connection between the DAO and the ICOs. Well, um, yes. 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 To a great extent, uh, uh, um, uh, the, the most uh, the most important uh, thing is uh, where uh, the, the the entity uh, issuing the, the the tokens is based. So uh, uh, it will be affected by the regulations of the country um, where the legal entity is based. Bitcoin is not a corporation, it is just a collective of people. There was one now. 
Yes, it, it had a foundation behind it. And usually, um, I mean, we, I, I don't think we have reached the stage uh, uh, where you can create a smart contract or some code and there is no entity other than that smart contract. There's usually someone who needs to take care of the, the marketing and then you most probably need to, um, I mean, have some operations and then there's some people who are involved in this creation of the smart contract. Um, and this, uh, these are all connections to the real world, so to say. So um, it's, uh, it, it's a smart contract on a, decentralized blockchain and I mean you can think there is no uh, legal entity behind it so to say it's just the, the smart contract entity but I'm pretty sure that regulators will find a way to um, to charge the people who are involved in this way in some I mean to uh, to find a way to to find the people who are behind the smart contract because I mean currently the physical people the, f the physical persons the physical um, represent themselves yes it's the guys who are running the yeah It's a, it's a bit different. It's a bit different. Whereas, so the, the big difference is that the DAO actually advertised their address and collected a lot of money, whereas, you know, Bitcoin just evolved organically. So, so it's a big part of your question, I guess, with the distinction there would be, are you asking about a DAO that's growing organically or a DAO that's actually collecting money? I mean, I think the, only, the question is, uh, time will tell. We'll, we'll see. From what we are, this is a step further from what we are facing right now. And there is no correct answer to your question. <laughs> Either just yes or no, something like that. We, we need to, to find, I mean, to see how this could happen uh, in the real world. Uh, someone might think of it and then, I mean, announce it somewhere. Maybe like Satoshi will announce it anonymously in, in Bitcoin talk and then we will take it from there. I mean, it's not impossible, I guess, to happen, but... No, this is, this is even, yeah, like maybe not a step further, but a few steps further from where we're currently, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just one question in the back. Uh, my question is about the current situation in Bulgaria. Do we need a license in order to operate as an exchange or over the counter, make over the counter transactions? Uh, what are the relationships uh, between uh, such a company, legal entity registered in Bulgaria and uh, the financial supervision, super, mm, financial supervision commission and the national revenue? because we are planning, uh, we are intending to do business with uh, cryptocurrencies in Bulgaria through, uh, as an ex uh, not as traders, but rather as uh, to make exchange and all, uh, also through ATMs. ATMs, the last thing was a ATMs. You were asking about uh, licensing of exchanges, first part, second part of the question was what? Uh, after, between the exchanges and the Financial Supervision Commission relations. Uh, 
at this <laughs> I, 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 uh, so so you 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 want to open a bank account uh, through which you want to for example establish a relation with an exchange so that you can use the exchange to do OTC deals in Bulgaria locally um, Okay, so I think I think you have uh, had the bad luck to select the the, the wrong bank. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's not one bank. The, a lot of banks require you to provide the three banks required you a license to do this. Uh, well, this is I mean. This is more or less trading. I mean, you are doing um, a broker. You are you are providing a brokerage service, not an exchange service, but a brokerage service. Uh, yes. And but but I, as far as I know, in Bulgaria there is no uh, requirement to have a license in order to do these things. And I'm not sure why banks are requiring requiring you to do this. We have a couple of uh, broker services here in Sofia, uh, which have been operating for years, I would say. And the banks that they're using um, have not required them to do like to have licenses. <laughs> Okay. Um, just to clarify, uh, one of the uh, brokers for Bitcoin uh, had their bank accounts shut down by Unicredit and also Raiffeisen and C Bank is the next one. So they work now with International Asset Bank. Um, it all depends on on the relationship. This was last month. Such an activity. Sorry. If you don't, if you don't provide financial services or brokerage services related to financial instruments, then you should not get or obtain a license. If you're uh, just exchanging bitcoins on behalf of your clients. Maybe, maybe you, you've put a wrong uh, activity, a description of the service uh, or description of the activity in the bank and that, that, that could be the reason to, to ask for a license. Or maybe uh, just keep in mind that the banks are, um, they can refuse you without a purpose. <laughs> so, but there is no uh, requirement at this point uh, under the Bulgarian. Okay, they don't want to work with entities who are involved somehow in Bitcoin. They just. Yeah. <laughs> Can I go? Um, this may not be a popular question. I feel the, the Tezos debacle is indicative of a larger ICO debacle because of this certain type of framework. Um, and I, I personally feel that, that the ICO is at best a crowdfunding mechanism, at worst a, a security. Uh, and when you use words um, coming from the U.S. securities market, I used file prospectuses with the uh, SEC, terminology is really important. And using words like investor for your token, investors expect returns, that's why they invest. Without being able to say profit is kind of walking a really, really fine line. Um, and then also using the word rights, because uh, my question is, it, sidestepping those things and trying to say that it's not a security, even if you don't fulfill the Howey test, you're using these words in English, the US SEC is gonna come after people, so that's dangerous. Um, in regards to protecting yourself, but my question is more to your token holders. How do you assign rights 
to your token holders, I won't call them investors, but how, how do you assign rights when you don't have an identity? If I buy a token with my Ether wallet, my identity is not assigned to that wallet by design. <laughs> I don't want it to be. So how do I have any rights with any of these token sales? Uh, well, you're right that the wording is very important, and uh, 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 your question is, uh, is uh, how your rights, uh, which are vested in your tokens, uh, are ascribed to the wallet or? No, how, to me, so let's say I buy a token. To the extent that you are the owner of the wallet. How do you know that? The personal key or the one who is the first to Yes. identify rights, because you're not going to get a name. So how do you assign rights to someone that doesn't have an identity or a government-issued identity? You have to tie it to something. So when people come after and say, I have a right to XYZ, things that they want to look at. Well, how do I redeem my rights? Well, yeah. Uh, here the question is, what kind of rights arise from the tokens? And not how do how they are assigned to you. So what kind of rights do you I'm want? Asking, you can assign whatever rights you want, but how do I how do I prove that those are my rights as a person? Well, this is like, like question, how do you prove that those are your rights? Well, you can assign whatever rights you want, but how do I prove that those are my rights as a person? Well, this is like question, how do you prove that you own five bitcoins that you're on your wallet? Yeah, so how but, do you give rights to people when it, it's not the people that have the rights? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's basically cryptographically ensured that the only person who can exercise any rights on that five bitcoins is the one who has the private key which is assigned to those five bitcoins. And if there are five or ten people who have, who, has, uh, like who have that private key, then all these rights are owned by them. I mean, if we are thinking from the, like the, from the perspective of cryptocurrency and bitcoin, uh, you have five bitcoins in your wallet because you own the keys. If someone owns your keys, um, then they have a, in a, exactly that much, that many rights as you, more or less. But I mean, if I think in the future, if there is a need uh, for the tokens to provide you with certain rights uh, and obligations, let's say, this will be again a step further in the, I mean, the regulation of ICOs and maybe some ICOs will require you to provide personal information. And even currently there are ICOs which require you to, um, like to provide your names, to provide uh, a passport identification, and then uh, some other private information. So this is happening, and maybe this is the way that you can assign rights to a certain person through their wallet, like through the wallet through which they have participated in the ICO. Um, and I've seen this with this project called Kin Kick. They, they, they did this. Um, they, you have to select a country, you need to provide personal information, and then you, you need to state from which wallet exactly you are going to send. And this is the only wallet that you'll be able to send from. So I think this is some kind of an answer to your question. If you have to add, I mean, ways to identify yourself on the internet, especially in Europe, digital signatures are a legally approved way of identifying a person on the internet. So. No, of course not. <laughs> yeah, of course not every I ICO thinks of that, but there there are mechanisms, but they are not applied every time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, actually, the digital signature are more more or less the same thing as a as a private key, but it's uh, issued by a but but it's issued from a centralized institution that ascertains that you are the owner of this private key or signature. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, two questions uh, in respect uh, to Brexit. Uh, what do you think about uh, starting starting ICO in the UK after uh, 2018, uh, 19? Pardon. And the second question is uh, uh, because for me this uh, this case with money wandering is a very. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, w w what is the the 
what is the possibility uh, the government to accuse you that uh, you are money wandering because uh, some of your, your investors are uh, from the black market or from uh, mafia or, and to take uh, to seize your uh, to stop your ICO to seize your uh, assets it is actually a quick, very interesting question how do you I mean, I have, I have had this question before. If, if I'm doing an ICO, do I want to be uh, involved in, um, so to say, blood bitcoins or blood eaters? Um, and I mean, you, you never know, but there is always, always a possibility that these, uh, this cryptocurrency came from somewhere. But what the legal application could be, I mean, I'll give it. Uh, as to your first question about uh, basing an ICO in uh, UK, I, don't, I wouldn't recommend uh, this, uh, not because of the Brexit, uh, but um, Great, Great Britain, to my opinion, is uh, not considered uh, a very good location for ICOs from tax purposes. Uh, it is a little bit complex to, to explain now, maybe on a next meeting uh, I could elaborate more on this because I need a, a little scheme to, to, to explain. Um, uh, however, you, you will be charged additionally, you will pay more, more taxes at the end. So um, I would not recommend UK if in, only in case you, if you have some, some special reason to base the ICO there. However, from regulatory and tax point of view, I wouldn't base an ICO, uh, an ICO there. And um, uh, I also um, um, read that uh, there will be some regulatory changes in some of their laws. I couldn't, I don't have the, the, the names exactly, uh, which will be very restrictive. So I wouldn't use UK. <laughs> you see. <laughs> about this part, about like, where the coins are coming from. You'll never know where coins are coming from. The either sort of bitcoins, you could never know. Yeah, you can... But then you will be prepared if you have done the proper KYC and anti-money laundering procedures. Yeah. But you ne at the end, you never know where the coins come from. Um, what do you mean a KYC and AML for, for each uh, person who is participating? Yeah. Um, but if you go through this, all of this KYC and AML during an ICO, this will... That's, exactly, that's why I said that it's uh, the big pain from... Ah, okay, okay, okay. From business point of view, it's, uh, it's going to be hard. And it might uh, stop some people from participating in your ICO. Or most of them. Uh, questions? Questions? Yes, uh, I have a question. So, what if we state that we don't have an ICO, but a charity event? And uh, basically, you're doing a donation because otherwise the CEO will commit suicide, for example. <laughs> like these uh, parties of ICOs? <laughs> It is illegal to base a charity on uh, some immoral reasons, so it is impossible. It is forbidden by the law, yes, it is an um, immoral reason to incorporate your entity, so it is not possible. Uh, the, the people who donate are well aware of what they are giving their money for. Is uh, this legally abiding to them in that, in that sense? Um, uh, I, maybe I didn't catch it. Uh, if uh, they haven't known that they donate their money for some immoral purposes, or no, they know there is an ICO, but uh, we just say it's a donation. So is that a uh, frame which is Uh, actually, this, this, is exactly, this is exactly what happened uh, in the case of Tezos. They have presented their, like, these cents of cryptocurrency of eaters as donations, as non-refundable donations. But I'm... I'm not sure what the new implications. you have any idea? So why are you giving the tokens against the donations? For free or for what? Uh, you, you can uh, constitute that uh, you have participated in the donation for the, uh, to the token, for example. Okay. Yeah. 
It's a token appreciation. It's like a charity. Token charity against the donations. Maybe, uh, maybe it should be underlined that um, uh, in the uh, light of the AML measures, um, uh, you should uh, uh, prove that you have undertaken some measures to investigate whether uh, the money or the donation is not coming from some um, illegal source. So you have to undertake certain measures to, to, to do this. Uh, and uh, there is a list of measures which could be undertaken. However, you should take some efforts to implement these measures. You can just say, uh, well, I haven't known they come from a murder or something like that. Um, you have to implement some um, um, affidavits to be undersigned, uh, declarations or some kind of, uh, some kind of documents. And uh, of course... Actually in Bulgaria, if you are um, a legal entity in the public benefit, you are uh, by law uh, required to um, to have these internal rules against money laundering and terrorist activities or something like this, uh, and this means that if you if you receive um, a donation which is larger than uh, thirty thousand Bulgarian leva uh, via bank or above uh, one thousand leva in cash, you you are required by law to, to get personal information and then there is this form that the person who is donating needs to fill in. And it, it includes I mean, information like apps full personal information more or less about where are the like about the person and, or the legal entity and where the money are coming from or is coming from. Did you want to add something? Uh, yes, uh, in, in under Bulgarian law, uh, the same law, you are obliged uh, if you are suspicious about money laundering, even if you are below the, this uh, this uh, th thresholds, uh, to contact the authorities. And this is, uh, you know, uh, for all the banks and all the insurers right now. And, and all uh, non-profit uh, legal entities in the public benefit also. Uh, question: There was one question here. Actually, I wanted to make a comment and maybe answer a little bit. Uh, BNP Paribas, uh, something like three years ago, got nine billion penalty for not respecting the compliance rules and anti-terrorist uh, anti uh, rules. So the profit of the whole global BNP Paribas was nine billion, and this was the penalty they had to pay for not respecting the rules. So. This happened, just to tell you, for a transaction that made, they made seven years ago. So, and, and then if you follow the banking stories, all the big banks got something like this, six million, five million, two million, billions, sorry, I'm talking billions euro. So just to, this is, this is something that you can take as an example, what does it cost? to not to take a anti-money laundering policy seriously. They will come after you five, times, five years later, ten years later, and they will check everything, and you will pay ten times that you actually won on this, because this was the penalty for BNP. The transactions were one billion, they pay nine billion uh, penalty. So just, just as an example, I think it will come to the Bitcoin world. Okay, uh, questions? Thank you. Uh, just to add uh, to the question uh, about the donation tokens, uh, if uh, the ICO is presented as a donation, does, does that detach from the security status? And uh, one more uh, practical question. Uh, uh, let's agree that KYC is a needed step. Uh, did, did somebody met a software that is uh, ready to read uh, two to four thousand uh, uh, personal identity cards that we will receive during the ICO, or we are doing that manually? Software. Yeah. Okay. You tell me then. That's exactly the. Um, why it will be hard for uh, people who are intending to launch a token generation event or a token sale uh, 
it, it will be hard for them to collect such data, but uh, from a legal standpoint, uh, it should be collected. No matter that it will take. Okay, uh, just an example maybe as uh, he has just said uh, the, 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 um, regu the, uh, the authorities will come after you maybe in five or ten years from now so you better do your things properly. <laughs> But yeah, there, there is a, a certain software or such software that already exists. Uh, you more or less need to hold your, I mean, it, it uses your camera and then uh, you need to stand in front of it with your ID next to your face and then it takes a photo and so on. But it's uh, uh, kind of automated and it, it's also uh, connected to some databases and it, uh, it's supposed to be okay. Actually, Bitcoin ATMs, some of the Bitcoin ATMs, the more advanced ones, they provide this kind of, uh, of KYC, so to say. Um, and uh, they use their cameras or they just, uh, you just scan your passport. It's more or less the same thing as the thing that it's on the airports that you, uh, that recently got um, actually uh, created or implemented. You can, uh, if you have a US, a U, um, EU passport, you can go through this other type of passport check. And it's more or less the same, more or less the same principle. Just a fun fact, how does that relate to the cyberpunk manifesto? You know, scanning your passport, taking a photo, duh. <laughs> you know, just, you know, just <laughs> some smiles. Yeah, the, the, the revolution will have to, I mean, it happened kind of, and now it's going to slow down a little bit. Uh, uh, more questions? Or maybe a few more questions and we can wrap it up. So just as a comment to the previous question, your question uh, about software, uh, you can use the API or providers that Airbnb or AirSwap token use. Uh, they are listed on their sites. So it's, uh, as he said, a fully auto automated process. So there is no problem handling uh, 4K or more uh, cards. I think actually if, if you are able to participate in an ICO, uh, although that you need to provide some personal information, it's still better than not being able to do it. So it's kind of a step forward. So you'll be able to participate in this big technological coin offering, so to say. Yes, you need to provide some personal information, but nonetheless, I mean, when Google happened, uh, a lot less people were able to participate in the IPO of Google than, I mean, ICOs uh, allow. So we have to differentiate three things. KYC, it means you need to know who you are dealing with. You know your client. Second thing, source of funds, anti-money laundering. So it's not enough that you know who you're dealing with. You have to know and you have to ask the person and the deepness of asking how deep you go, it's, it's a whole science, but you have to really make sure that you know where the money is coming from. So this is a separate topic. Just knowing identity is not enough. You have to know the source of funding. Then there's anti-terrorist regulation. That is another thing. You have two lists of people on uh, EU websites that you have to really implement in your system and scan everybody who you checked. Maybe you even have it somewhere, yeah? So, so there, is a, there is a list that you have to scan everybody through this list and make sure that you are not dealing with a terrorist. If you do, oh my God. Um, so that was a comment actually. Uh, and two, two final questions here and there and then we are done. Okay, so my question is for the two legal experts here. Um, so imagine that you're the minister of finance or economics or else uh, and you're just that for a day and uh, you can propose some legislation to the parliament to vote it uh, or you can take some action you know for these ICOs and the uh, investing trading that happens what would you do? Wow. <laughs> it's a job interview question. <laughs> 
<laughs> what would be that? What would I'm going to? <laughs> <laughs> this is a tricky question. So um, the fact is that um, making legislature legislature is not something that can be done in a day or two or something. This is a whole process that involves a lot of people, a lot of uh, knowledge, a lot of uh, viewpoints, and. Uh, a lot of things, and it cannot be done just for a day. And but, okay, yes, I do, and ex exactly because I do have uh, such view, and that, that this is the reason I cannot. Uh, I, I'm not saying that I cannot do. I can do it just for a day. That this is not uh, something stable. I think usually regulators are just, if there is a chance of something happening, then they will do something that it can prevent it. Uh, so usually they're very extreme. Uh, but what I would personally do, uh, if I have this chance, is to try to find a middle, middle ground. So below um, licensed, licensed investors and uh, above, like basically, scammer or anyone. Uh, so just some kind of a middle ground which allows for a larger part of, uh, of like a larger part of users to participate in these things. Switzerland, you know their concept of sandbox. Maybe like in Switzerland, uh, you know the concept of sandbox they introduced recently. Yeah, maybe, maybe something like this will, I, I would do. Uh, so let there be some regulation, uh, but um, uh, not, so, not so harsh like in the UK, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Again, final, final question there in the back. Um, so I have two questions. The first one is regarding to the AML, but it's very short, you know. So regarding to the AML, um, how it's working, like if we raise funds, uh, should we, do we need a lawyer to do the AML, or is it some uh, form online or something like that? And the second question is, if we have two tokens, one that is a security and one that is a utility, is it possible to raise funds uh, with Americans through the utility, and then to tell them that with the utility, they can buy the uh, security. It's quite, quite, quite weird. <laughs> okay, uh, your second question. You should <laughs> consult it with your legal counselors and consultants. Uh, better uh, if it's a security it will be security all over the world most probably and uh, in such case you should not consider only the only sec but all the authorities uh, that regulate securities around the world so uh, you better focus on the utility token uh, that's in my personal opinion uh, yes. As to your uh, as to your question, uh, do you need a lawyer? I would recommend so. Not because uh, yes, yes, uh, yes. Because I, I have I personally have clients, uh, and um, all of them uh, would, uh, mm, of course, they come and uh, say, uh, but uh, why do I need uh, um, um, your services? I know this AML, know your customer, white paper, oh, uh, it is all um, um, in Google, and so on. This is not the case. Um, you need some advice, maybe, um, uh, because you see, uh, we are on one meeting, and there are so many questions about one ICO. So, Yes, I would recommend some advice, professional advice. And I think there was a comment on, that, on these two questions here. Yeah, so anti-money laundering. If, if, I will answer the first question. Hello? No. Hello? No. Hello? So the first question. Yeah, if, if you have a person from EU 
investing with you and he sends the money somehow from a, you can really identify the source of fund. It's very easy. Basically, you don't need a lawyer, you need a person that is, is just like a processor. You ask a couple of questions, you say source of funds, okay, EU territory, I got it from here, here, but EU citizens, it's quite easy. The problem comes when you get it outside, because then imagine you have a person from Japan sending you money, and then you have to have reasonable uh, proof that you do everything that you have in your force to check that this money is, is legal. The documentation is in Japanese, and so on, so on. So then th this is where the problem starts to happen. And then it's really, you, you have to see the regulation is very well explained. Just read what the Anti-Money Laundering Act says. It's, it's a knowledge that is widely displayed, how deep you have to go. And sometimes it's very deep, but sometimes it's very easy. It depends who you're dealing with. Okay, so I think this can this final reply could close the discussion. I think it was maybe helpful for at least some of you. And see you next time, guys. Thank you for being here. And thank a big thank you to our legal advisors.